Having figured out what the monopolist does, it's natural for us to want to compare the monopolist situation with the competitive situation. In other words, suppose society has a certain technology. Should we give it to a monopolist to run this industry, or should we give it to a competitive set of competitive firms? We have lots of different contexts in which we could do that comparison. We have short run types 1 and 2, and long run types A, B, C, and D. So in all those different kinds of technologies, we could ask the question, do we want to give it to a competitive industry or do we want to give it to a monopolist? It turns out that since our main tool in this course is not mathematics but graphs, it's really hard to answer that except in the case of long run uh, constant returns to scale. And the reason is that in the other cases, either something kind of weird happens in competition, like increasing returns of scale, where you don't have a competitive equilibrium, or it's hard to figure out on just one graph, or impossible to figure out on just one graph, both the monopoly and the competitive equilibrium, mostly because you can work out the competitive supply curve for one firm, but you can't work out the competitive price because the competitive price is determined by how many firms you have in the market. And so it's not just determined by one firm, it's determined by all the other firms. And even if you assumed that, that all the other firms were identical, you still couldn't do it on one graph. You'd have to know how many there were. So we are going to confine our discussion on monopoly versus competition to the one type of cost that makes it simple. And that's constant returns to scale in the long run. So that's what I have drawn with these uh, three graphs. The first graph, graph I'm going to call it graph number one, is monopoly. And the second two graphs, two and three, are for competition. Let's talk about demand first. Demand is drawn in graph number one and graph number three. It's drawn in graph number one because that's a monopoly graph and the monopolist knows the demand curve. The demand curve is not drawn in graph number two because graph number two, you see above it it says one firm, that's one competitive firm. And the one competitive firm doesn't know what the market demand curve is. He thinks the demand curve is flat, which it actually isn't. So we don't draw the market demand curve in graph number two. We do draw it in graph number three, that's the entire market under competition. And that's the appropriate place to put the market demand curve for competition. Now let's see where to put the average cost and marginal cost. I'm talking about constant returns to scale, so average and marginal cost are equal and they are constant, so that's why I have a horizontal line. It's appropriate to draw it in graph number one because that's the monopoly firm. And it's appropriate to draw it in graph number two because that's the one competitive firm and he, he of course knows what his costs are. It's not appropriate to draw it in number three because costs are something that concern each individual firm. They don't concern the whole market. So this is the way we start. This is before any optimization, before the monopolist decides what to do or before the competitive firm decides what to do. These are just the, the uh, external facts that are given to the two agents. Let's work on competition first. You know that if the long run margin cost looks the way it does in graph number two, then that also forms the supply curve of the individual competitive firm. Um, maybe I should call that S1, just to denote the fact that it's just well, one firm. And I'm going to assume that all firms are identical, and therefore the industry supply curve is just going to be adding up a whole bunch of curves like that, and when you have add up a whole bunch of horizontal lines, you just get a horizontal line. So let me draw that. Okay, so that's the industry supply curve for competition. Then competitive equilibrium occurs where supply equals demand. So drawing that in. QC is the competitive equilibrium quantity and PC is the competitive equilibrium price. We could stop there, but just to remind you what, what's happening in graph number two, 
the competitive firm thinks that price is given at PC. So, so he thinks that the demand curve he faces is right at right along the PC line. You could draw it over here with with green. So P equals A R equals M R is the way that the competitive firm perceives the situation. Let's turn, I'll just mark the competitive point in graph number three. Now let's turn to graph number one of the monopolist. So the monopolist knows about the demand curve and he perceives demand as being equal to average revenue. Of course, demand I is equal to average revenue. In graph number two, this is also the demand curve as perceived by the individual firm, but of course it's not the real demand curve. In graph number one, the monopolist knows the real demand curve, and so he knows where average revenue is. I have, just because I'm lazy, I've drawn the demand curve as a straight line, uh, and that'll tell me exactly where the marginal revenue curve is. You know that if the demand curve is a straight line, then, uh, oops, let me do that not so hard. And the marginal revenue curve has the same p-intercept and exactly twice the slope. So that's marginal revenue. The monopolist sets marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, which is here, because right, this is marginal revenue and this is marginal cost. So that's where marginal revenue equals marginal cost. As you'll recall, that determines monopoly quantity, which I'll draw right now. And then you go up to the demand curve and over to determine monopoly price. So that point is where the monopoly price and quantity meet. So that's the that, that completes the description of the monopoly quantity and the competitive quantity. But I want you to notice next that so we, we want to compare these two, and so we need to get them on the same graph. And I want you to notice next that it's actually quite easy to graph from point from graph number three. Th this competitive price and quantity is really easy to know. Whoops. Sorry about that. It's really easy to know where that is in graph number one because the the height of the supply curve in graph three is the same as the height of average LR, LRAC and LRMC in graph one. So it's going to be here. In other words, the the two points that I've marked with red circles are the same point. So, I'll, I'll mark this a little bit differently now on the on the uh, on the monopoly graph. I'm going to put this here, and this is I'm going to I'll label this competition. And of course, this was monopoly. At this point, some students looking at graph number one ask, why is the competitive industry not going where marginal revenue equals marginal cost? I mean, marginal revenue equals marginal cost here, and the competitive industry isn't going there. Are they dumb? Don't they know that to maximize profit, you set marginal revenue equal to marginal cost? Well, the answer is that that's not the way the competitive firm perceives things. The competitive firm's perception is graph number two, where marginal revenue does equal marginal cost. So. So nobody's being dumb here. It's just that when I draw the competitive point here in graph number one, 
you have to know that that's not consistent with marginal revenue and average revenue. The competitive firm doesn't see marginal revenue and average revenue being there. The competitive see firm sees marginal revenue and average revenue as being here in graph number two. So, uh, so the the MR and AR in graph number one are appropriate to the monopolist. They're not appropriate to the competitive firm. I'm just transferring the competitive firm's point onto graph number one, so I can do the following, which is to ask a question of a kind I've never asked before in this class. Is one of these points better than the other? Is the monopoly point better or worse than the competitive point? Now, everything else I've done so far up to this class has been positive economics. In other words, what happens? But asking whether one point is better or worse than another point is normative economics. That is, what should happen? Making value judgments about whether one point is good or bad. We don't have any tools to answer that kind of uh, question, that, that, that kind of normative question. So we can, we, we can say qualitatively what's, what's happened. Let me uh, take PC and QC from graph number three and put them on graph number one. So here's, here's uh, QC. Now, this is just a coincidence that QC is going to going to end up being really close to where the MR curve hits the hits the uh, horizontal axis that's pure coincidence if i'd moved if i'd drawn average co uh, margin cost a little bit differently that wouldn't have happened so but any in any case QC is here and PC is here and the question we're asking is is the combination of QC PC which gets you the competitive point better or worse than the combination of QM and PM, which gets you the monopoly point. Well, we can say that the competitive point has more quantity produced at a lower price. The monopoly point has less quantity produced at a higher price. So the monopolist restricts output and charges a higher price. And that's a very uh, classic and almost general result. That's what monopolists do. They restrict output and charge a higher price. Now, they, they don't charge the highest possible price, because the, <laughs> the highest possible price would be here. And if, if the monopolist charged that price, he'd be selling nothing. So that's not the profit-maximizing thing to do. So the monopolist um, trades off appropriately and, and chooses, but ends up choosing a higher price than the competitive industry. and. Uh, a corresponding lower quantity, but in terms of what's better, what's worse, clearly the competitive situation is better for consumers. They get lower prices and bigger quantities. But just as clearly the monopoly situation is better for the firm. If firms were were offered to you know, a, a chance of becoming a monopolist, every firm would say, yeah, as long as that were, was legal, they wouldn't get punished. Any firm would want to be a monopolist. So for industry, the monopoly is better. For consumers, competition is better. For society as a whole, well, both the monopolist and the consumers belong to society. So we need to make some kind of overall social judgment about what's better or worse, n not being, not uh, taking the point of view of just the industry or just the consumers. So we need to develop appropriate economic tools to answer a nor this kind of normative question about whether the monopoly position or the competitive position is better or worse and so we'll do that on the on the other videos and then we will come back to this question of monopoly versus competition once we have the tools to answer it